the eighth Rocky movie and its second spin-off broke me as a human being. I mean, I don't got a body or nothing, but yeah. I need a hug. <laughs> Whoever thought we'd be this happy to be back in the Rocky universe, right? Anyway, it's been three years since uh, the events of the first movie, both in reality and on screen. And in that time, Adonis Creed has become the name to beat in the ring, okay? So this literally culminates in him opening this movie with winning the heavyweight championship belt. Yeah, just like his dad. So, a challenger enters the arena. A challenger who wants to stake his claim to the belt. He wants his time to fight. The catch... That challenger is none other than Victor Drago, son of the man who beat Adonis' pops to death in the ring. Here's a clip. But you don't think I can beat him? Is that what you're trying no. to say? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm not going to be here forever. And what's that supposed to mean? That means you got to do some smart thinking. Oh, you want to talk about smart decisions, Rock? You in this house all alone. Who been taking care of you? Me. I've been here for you. Who else you got? Listen. I'm taking this fight with or without you. You know, like 30 years ago when Rocky IV came out, Eddie Murphy used to actually still be funny. So I'm going to let him sum up how I felt coming out of this. All right, Rocco! All right, Sly! Look, nobody in their right mind thought that Creed was going to turn out to be any good. So when it turned out to actually be brilliant, and it made Michael B. Jordan a movie star, and it gave Ryan Coogler the clout to make what's arguably the best Marvel movie, yeah, it, it, it turned some heads. I mean, more than a few. <laughs> you, hell, it even got Stallone an Oscar nomination. Nobody saw that coming. Nobody. Not even you. Stop lying. So what was particularly noticeable about that first movie, though, was the way they were trying to make it as real-world as possible. And so the whole, my dad got killed by a genetically enhanced Russian super soldier, well, that element kind of had to be dropped as much as possible. Not here, though. Oh, boy, not here. Though, admittedly, the whole Soviet Steve Rogers backstory thing goes weirdly unacknowledged. Anyway, what you get with Creed 2 is the most nakedly cynical pitch for a sequel you have ever seen. I mean, it's like the Meg as far as movie concepts go. What if we just do a Rocky IV sequel that doesn't suck? Like Rocky V did. Yeah, they pull it off. They pull it off and then some. There is a seriously strong script behind this. Cheo Hidari Koka, who was behind that ridiculously awesome Luke Cage series, uh, he pitched in on the story, and there's a relative unknown named Jewel Taylor who's co-written this uh, with Stallone. And, well, I mean, that sounds terrible, but then if you cast your mind back, dude kind of got an Oscar nom for writing the first one of these, like, way back when our parents were dating, so, yay. It's sharp, it's poignant, it's moving as hell, it's actually pretty funny too. Uh, I mean, that's always kind of where the Rocky series lands on an individual film-by-film -film basis, but the results have just never been this strong, never been this powerful, never been this damn good. On the performance front, the big three are just killing it. I mean, Michael B. Jordan's an outright icon with this thing, it's such a great turn. And physically, there's, there's obviously a pretty damn good reason he's playing a dude named Adonis, you know what I mean? So Tessa Thompson, meanwhile, is parlaying her Bianca, all the, sort of the, the wife, girlfriend, love interest character. She's parlaying her Bianca into something more of a, a Halsey-style performer, like doing really well with the sort of the, the, the hearing impairment element that she's given her work with as well. And she does all of this while simultaneously ensuring that she hits any mark she's given, no matter how broadly ridiculous that mark should be, when you stop and consider just how ludicrous this film actually is. And even though he got a Best Supporting Actor nomination last time out of this, I'm pretty sure Stallone could manage that again for this. I mean, he's genuinely terrific. I mean, he's definitely going to get that if the threat of him actually not continuing with the role of Rocky turns out to be true. Does anyone actually believe that, though, in the slightest? I mean, that dude will literally die on screen playing either Rocky or Rambo, right? I mean... 
I'd kind of prefer if it was Rocky, because, well, Rocky never pitched him with Al-Qaeda for one thing, but... Anyway, so, Felicia Rashad's back. For somewhat obvious narrative reasons, she has a pretty beefed-up part this time around. And uh, Russell Hornsby, who killed it recently in The Hate You Give, which if you haven't seen, you gotta see. So good. Uh, he's joined the roster too. The big draw, though, is the Dragos. I mean, you get Florian Montanu, who... Doesn't get the greatest personality in the world to show off, but he makes what he does get pretty damn imposing. And then you get the one and only Dolph Lundgren in there. And yep, He-Man is back. And somebody at some point, after like 30 years, has taught him how to act. And taught him well, too. I mean, this is the best performance anyone has ever rung out of Dolph Lundgren. I mean, I just want to stop and say that again. Dolph Lundgren is genuinely great in a movie. A Rocky movie, too. A Rocky spin-off, no less. Huh. Anyway, Ryan Coogler's obviously got, like, too much Black Panther money he needs to be counting right now, so he's not back, although I think he is credited as a producer on this. Uh, instead, you get the relatively unknown Stephen Capel Jr. Uh, taking the helm, and wow, okay, nice pull, guys. Nice pull. Uh, Capel's well and truly got the goods. He knows how to shoot these things with an emotional lens. He deliberately paces himself for dramatic effect. Like, the early fights are intentionally a little subdued. Like, you, you notice this very early on, for instance, with the heavyweight championship fight. A uh, little bit subdued so that he can, like, full-on go for it as he goes on. And that stuff's great. And when these characters get into the sort of psychological baggage behind everything that's going on with them, you're mentally right up in there with them. I mean, I'd never heard of Stephen Cable Jr. before this movie was on the way. I mean, I now would very much like to hear about him very soon, please, like, more. I mean, isn't there a Blade reboot we need to get to at some point? And someone must have John Boyega's phone number, right? Just saying. Those emotional beats, though, wow. I mean, even looking past the, you know, the requisite, you can't win, Rack! You know, sort of stuff that we kind of take for granted with these flicks. Just the domestic stuff with Michael Jordan and Tessa Thompson is insanely powerful. I mean, they're real in a way that Adrian and Rocky just never got to be. I mean, okay, admittedly, it kind of helps that they've not got Paulie and that weird robot that he was boning to deal with. But uh, still, it's genuinely flabbergasting that you're seeing a screenplay brought to life that not only manages to believably pull off a concept this insane, not only manages to be professional, Bound and not only manages to reduce grown men to rubble in a way that we usually have to lose fast and furious cast members to achieve, but it also manages to be so down to earth and investable on like a human level too. I mean, it's never mentioned, for instance, like, but Adonis would at least be a millionaire by now, right? I mean, that thought didn't even occur to me as I was watching this, and this dude buys an LA loft with all the grandeur that most of us give to picking our sneakers for the day. It lands every punch, every blow, and every single one of them seriously counts. Not only counts, but actually takes a toll on you, like, viscerally and emotionally. There's some great little continuity-based in-jokes in there, like callbacks to Rocky IV and the other movies, and there's some returning players in cameo form. I mean, I don't want to spoil it for you, but for me, for my money, admittedly, the coolest one is the dude who literally plays his role for a living. Um, and if you ask me, this whole thing like kind of brilliantly comes off as a sort of millennial remake of Rocky 3 for like the first two acts, and then for the third act, millennial Rocky 4. I mean, I'm down. Hell, I mean, they even invert Rocky 4's like pretty epic training sequence, though I will, I will admit they, they do kind of noticeably drop the ball when it comes to Rocky 4's epic soundtrack. I mean, this isn't even 10% as cool as Rocky 4's soundtrack was. But you knew that was going to be the case from the jump. I mean, Burning Heart, No Easy Way Out, Hearts on Fire. That was one of the all-timer soundtracks. I mean, come on, deep down, y you love the Rocky IV soundtrack. Everyone loves the Rocky IV soundtrack. Sure, I mean, you got Kendrick in there, but you just know it can't possibly measure up. So, fellas, if you want a seriously fist-pumping time at the movies this weekend, see this. Ladies, if you want a seriously fist-pumping time at the movies this weekend, see this. Couples, go and cry together. Children, if you'd like to learn about human feelings and your own daddy issues, don't see this. At all. I mean, this'll, this'll kill you inside. I'm not even kidding. I get to sit down after this and, like, have a smoke outside the cinema. I mean, you can't see behind this animated melon, but there's, like, water tracks down my face from just, like, weeping. Like, genuine weeping. It's just so good. It's just so, so good. 
It's probably my favorite movie experience of this year. Like, hands down. I'm not even kidding. No embellishment, no hyperbole. I have not had this much fun at the movies this year. And you need to seriously consider what movies came out this year. It's an absolutely belting four stars from me. Every second of it hit me. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. If you've never seen the first movie, absolutely see the first movie. I mean, it's great. And then see this, because that first movie's great. This is terrific. And you know what? I, I want four more of these in a spin-off series. And evidently, they could they could pull that off. So another movie I really like this week, obviously not to the extreme that I liked uh, Creed 2, Anna and the Apocalypse, which is a really out there movie that you'd probably best describe as a Scottish zombie Christmas musical. I mean, if you can imagine such a thing, I know it sounds bizarre. Basically, it's Shaun of the Dead in a British secondary school, but at Christmas and stage like High School Musical. Really. I know, it's really weird, right? So it stars Ella Hunt and Paul Kay and Mark Benton and Malcolm Cumming, who, I, I swear, I spent the first half hour of this thinking that dude was Tyler Drew Honey from Outnumbered. It's not, though. Anyway, it's a bit of a riot. The songs are insanely well thought out and follow that sort of American werewolf notion of being slyly relevant and cleverly worded so they fit what's uh, what's going on in the background and they add subtext to things and they, they emote the feelings, etc. in a really clever and sort of witty way. It's really cool. There's, there's some great songs in there. I had the soundtrack on Spotify within an hour of watching this. That's how much I enjoyed this movie. Uh, Paul K swinging from the rafters a little bit as a sort of would-be demon headmaster. And it's definitely far from competently directed by John McPhail, but what is there is a lot of fun, and you can't help but think if it had a slightly more capable director, well, it could have landed at least close to being this generation's Rocky Horror Picture Show, and I do not say that lightly. Uh, sadly, it did not, and it is not, so three stars from me, and that's admittedly largely out of like sheer likability and fun. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, rate, and review.